Good morning and welcome to our panel number two, <clears throat> which is called The Russian Revolution and the Roots of Today's Globalized World. Uh, I am Professor Audrey Alstead, a professor of history at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. <clears throat> I'm also a two-time um, <clears throat> Kennan alumna, and I have the honor to serve at present as the chair of the uh, Kennan Advisory Council. Today's topic uh, was formulated by a number of people who helped organize this panel uh, and this entire conference, and it really represents in a lot of ways some of the best uses of historical analysis and knowledge uh, in its application to looking at subsequent events and some of the politics of today as well. Among our themes are going to be imperialism, capitalism, communism, and cosmopolitanism, because these were all issues, of course, which preoccupied prominent thinkers around the time of World War I and the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, the Russian Revolution, in, which includes the Bolshevik coup. Um, <clears throat> the situation remains really quite similar today, uh, even as we find contentious discussions around globalism with increasing unpopularity of globalism in some communities, including uh, former Soviet territories, Europe, and the United States, and elsewhere in North America. So what can we learn about globalization as we understand it today from the experience of 1917, both in terms of its narration, its analysis, and some of the prophecies of that time period? As you know from your handouts, we have full biographies of our four distinguished presenters, uh, and I'll only introduce them briefly right at this moment. Um, and, and the arrangement in which they're seated is going to be the way in which they will speak. Uh, each one uh, has agreed to limit him or herself to five to seven minutes uh, on initial topics related to this, and then we'll move along on some other issues and then take lots of questions from the audience. Uh, our first participant is um, Leon Aaron, resident scholar and director of Russian studies at the American Enterprise Institute, where he studies Russian domestic and foreign policy. Next to him is Andrea Graziosi, the president of the National Agency for the Evaluation of Universities and Research in Rome. Uh, he's also center associate at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. Uh, next is um, Professor Elizabeth Woods, <coughs> professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she co-directs the MISTI Russian program, coordinates Russian studies, and advises to the Russian language program. And finally, Will Pomerantz, deputy director of the Kennan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies of the Woodrow Wilson Center here in Washington, and also a historian. So I'd like to ask um, Leon Aaron to begin. Thanks very much. Um, our hosts asked us to produce uh, lessons of the 1917 revolution as far as globalization is concerned. And our esteemed chair added um, that she would like to hear about the impact of the end of the USSR on uh, globalization. So let me start by, by stating um, a, a fairly obvious fact, which is the revolution of 1917 was the defining instance of a global millenarian eschatological movement under overlapping, sometimes confusing, monikers of Marxism, communism, and socialism. Globalism, understood as victory on a global scale, was absolutely central to the movement's mission. Indeed, until Stalin radically revised the movement, proclaiming the possibility of socialism in one country, Globalism was the most important criterion by which the makers of the October Revolution judged its success or failure. And indeed, uh, 70 years later, by mid-1980s, uh, the movement that the revolution started had more than a third of the world population under its control, making it uh, very likely the third most successful global ideological movement next to Christianity and Islam. While the three elements of the ideological content of um, the revolution or the movement, which is Marxism, communism, and socialism, seem to have lost uh, much of their appeal, at least for now. Other components of successful globalization heralded by the October Revolution are very much alive and, and could be counted, I think, as the lessons that we were likely to list or we were asked to list. So let me mention a few 
um, uh, of these phenomena, which I think are uh, the most relevant today. The first lesson is that a successful global movement could be touched off by a fanatical minority ready to kill and be killed for an idea. Um, no matter, first of all, how tiny that minority is, remember uh, that uh, Lenin and Trotsky, the two men who made the revolution, um, uh, until about mid-20s, well, certainly after, after um, uh, Lenin's death and, and Trotsky's essentially demise as, as the political leader uh, of the Soviet Russia, they referred to the revolution as uh, Oktyabrsky Pirivarot, as October, October coup. Uh, you could check all Lenin's uh, works and all Trotsky's work, including his famous Uroki Oktyabrya, uh, the lessons of the October. It was only under Stalin, for obvious reasons, largely for the reasons of legitimation of his regime, that it became a revolution. Secondly, um, uh, it doesn't matter how, uh, uh, what kind of detailed blueprint uh, that minority has or does not have for the future. Um, remember that Lenin admitted in 1920 um, that, that the plan for the new society uh, was very simple. Um, he wrote, Mujik das nam chleb, my разверstaем его по заводам, и будет у нас коммунизм. The peasant will give us bread, we will distribute it to the factories, and that's how we will build communism. And in fact, uh, in fact, uh, that's exactly how they proceeded in the first three years following the revolution uh, in the so-called period of war communism, which became like the, uh, like the coup, became the revolution. There was no war at, at first to modify. It was the period of communism. Stalin added war. Um, actually, Lenin added it when they moved to um, uh, the new economic policy to delegitimize that period and, and make it easier to move towards a more or less uh, moneyed economy. The second lesson is that a successful globalization can begin as in many respects anti-globalization. Uh, that is a reaction, among other things, to the cosmopolitanism um, uh, that our, our chair mentioned. And it's true that uh, along with communism, as, along with capitalism and imperialism, Cosmopolitanism was um, a key component of the ideological and political context which produced the revolution. Um, and in fact, those who made the revolution shared, at least initially, quite a few convictions of cosmopolitans of 1917 and of today. The obsolescence of nationality, the obsolescence of national cultures, of national sovereignty, and national borders. What they utterly rejected, however, was the notion of the diversity of values rather than the prominence and preeminence of some over others. And they certainly abhorred facts and truth as open to interpretation rather than objectively established through scientific, materialistic uh, um, uh, uh, mode, of operandi, mode of operandi. So they no, theirs were and are, I should say, the only right values. Theirs were and are the only correct facts and versions of history. And theirs was and is the only acceptable truth because its authorship is sanctified by the God of history. Lesson number three, a central element of a successful ideological globalization is messianism and the belief in predestination. That is the inexorability of a certain kind of future because it is foretold in a sacred prophecy. Uh, they were out to achieve what the great French uh, historian Francois Furet called salvation through history. Theirs was a mission to remake humanity, to end prehistory, and to forge a new civilization, delivering the humanity, as Engels put it so famously, from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. And they felt supremely lucky, in fact, more than lucky, chosen and privileged to be instruments of the fulfilling of that prophecy. Live or dead, they were to win. And so finally, the strength uh, and the spread of uh, this credo, um, in my opinion, has not really been damaged fatally by the demise of the Soviet Union. And that is because the totalitarian temptation that produced the October Revolution is very much with us today. Um, those who succumb 
to this temptation, continue to espouse the zero-sum manichaeism of Lenin, the stigmatization, demonization, and eventually dehumanization of the enemy, the fanatical hatred of democratic capitalism, or as it was well, well known then, bourgeois philistinism, and the ecstatic hope of deliverance from the uncertainties of economic and political competition into a conflictless Eden under an all-knowing, omniscient, and infinitely caring state, whether under the general secretary or a caliph. Thank you. Yes, I would like to start by quoting the two questions I, I, we were asked to answer and to address. Because at the beginning, they created problems to me. Then I think uh, th they were interesting enough, actually. So I am very grateful. First, we were asked to draw parallels between the globalization of the era of the World War and the Russian Revolution and our own era of globalization. And then to consider how the failure of the USSR shaped the globalism of the 21st century. That, you know, I am an historian, a very traditional one, so to me this was, you know, think about something else, not just history, history. But it was very interesting. And I would say first, to the first question, that actually we are not comparing two globalizations, but actually two reactions and two, uh, if you want, uh, opposition to globalization. The first one generated by World War I, in the sense I don't know if without World War I there would have been a reaction to the first big wave of globalization that started at the end of the 19th century and ended in 1914. And the reaction to globalization of today that has not a specific cause, which is the same all over the world, that has many, I believe, specific causes but that it is present all over the world, more or less, in many different guises. So we are discussing not two globalization, but two reactions to globalizations, to two stages of globalization. This is my first impression. The second is that I agree with what Leo said. Socialism is certainly a global project, an ideolo but on the ideological front, ideologically speaking. But socialism in this century, in the past century, sorry, has not been only ideology. It has been a reality in China, in India, if you want, in a different way, in the Soviet Union, in Eastern Europe, in Vietnam or in Korea. And from this point of view, socialism has not been a force for globalization, for sure. Because economically speaking, for example, we are talking about autarkic economies, as we all know. Or the movement of peoples has been stopped. Or very much slow down unless you are considering forced migration or deportations. Uh, so actually you are speaking of a movement socialist that has been in theory extremely global and cosmopolitan but in practical uh, extremely anti-global, uh, very autarkic and actually took even the form of this under Stalin in a very I would say perfected form. And uh, yesterday, in the debate yesterday, we mentioned the internal passport. In the Soviet Union, you needed an internal passport to move. This is not g globalism. This is not <coughs> even uh, freedom of movement within a single country. And this is not Stalin invention. If you read the debate of the social democrats, the German social democrats at the end of the 19th century, the idea of uh, a, a socialism in one country, actually in one empire, was already there and very strongly, and even Bernstein uh, at the moment supported it. The idea was that the revolution could come in a single large country, not in a small one, possibly with a colonial empire, and possibly could build an, a, an autarkic system that would be very superior to capitalism, and, but this we will not touch because, of course, it's not true, was not true. But still, uh, from this point of view, socialism has been, I would say, uh, 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 a force that worked against globalism. Take Mao Zedong China. China opened it up and started actually globalization, the new wave of globalization at the end of the 1980s because of Deng Xiaoping reversal of Mao policies, complete reversal, if not on in the ideological, and this too is very interesting. So I would say that uh, with the revolution in 1917, you entered the near of let's say anti-globalization in a way that put a stop to the previous one. 
And then with World War II, you entered into an era of control globalization. Control because, of course, the West integrated, there was the, the free, you know, in the European space was built, the, the, the Atlantic economy. But for example, the colonization produced a lot of autarkic system. Think of India again. India was not opened up to globalization until 1991. And China was closed enough and did not participate in the world economy until 19, uh, by India until 1991, sorry, and China before uh, 1978. So I would say that there was this controlled globalization that worked pretty well. And then in between 1978 and 1991, we had really unregulated uh, full speed globalization. First with the entry of China, then with the entry of India and the collapse of the socialist bloc and the former socialist economies that entered the world markets <coughs> and so on and so forth. And I think this uh, unregulated movement that was very good for the people that participated in it because I, I, I'm rather, I, I always hear also in Italy that of course globalization, um, the inequality grew, but of course this is not true as you all know. On the global scale, uh, the, the income of China, India and all the, has grown enormously over these 20 years. The problem is the <laughs> victims of globalization are within the West and the former privileged parts uh, <coughs> of the world, especially Europe, especially Europe. The United States is left less, but still affected, but less affected, I would say, with Europe. So I would say that what we have now is a reaction to globalization, which is stronger precisely in the places where I, which have been affected neg negatively, which is, Europe and the United States. I would say that in China, if you take their position, they have no anti-globalism, anti-globalization, but actually they are very much in favor of it, and, and it, India too, although in their own ways. So I think you have to distinguish very much. I think that you, you have always to, to look for difference, and I would like to finish with some consideration, since I have, of course, my preferences, as many people in this room, and, and we all have different preferences, and I do like cosmopolitanism and liberalism and freedom. Uh, the problem is that it is unless, and because I say this because we, this came up in the former panel and also in the yesterday very strongly, it seems <coughs> that people like me, we do not have a language to confront and address the reaction to this I would say open globalization that is dramatically affecting former privileged part of the world like Europe and the United States. I would say less the United States, I insist on this because it's very different. And to, to confront this and to create this new language and, and to confront this globalization that is altering so profoundly the equilibria in the world, you need to contaminate the cosmopolitan discourse with the national and the social, for sure, as Lenin did with socialism in 1917 very <coughs> successfully. Of course, he did it in completely different terms, but he was a very great politician and, and from this point of view. And I will end that when, since I will also ask about the legacy, I would say that the two legacies of, the, of 1917 today are two Leninist invention. One is the Communist Party and the communist way of managing politics, and this is empowering China, which is not a minor legacy. And the other is the national solution to, the, to a federal problem, which is in India, and you know that India was organized in the 50s alongside, alongside the Soviet model. So you have that India and China are embodiments of two different Leninist ideas, which is not a bad legacy, that is in terms of impact at least. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Elizabeth Wood. So I want to actually go back to February 1917, which means that my p picture of the revolution will be rather different than my esteemed colleague Laren, Leon Ahrens. Um, I think we have to remember that February revolution was not a minority at all. February revolution, the entire nation took to the streets, uh, especially, of course, the cities, Petrograd and, and Moscow. But um, what, I'm, what I want to try to figure out is to, I, a couple of things. One is, what is the relationship between the protests in, 19, in 1917 and the protests in Russia in 2017? Mm -hmm. And then also, what is the role of symbolic politics in relation to what I would call 
real politics, which means contest contestation over uh, actual uh, um, disbursement of uh, real political topics. Uh, I'll explain. But let, to start with 1917, um, we have to ask, what did 1917 mean to people at the time? And I think it meant two things. One was chaos and incredible hardship. We have to remember that the February Revolution happened in the middle of World War I. So the, that f f crucially global moment for for Russia as well as for the United States. Um, it happened in the middle of a uh, complete breakdown of supplies. The trains were going east-west instead of north-south, so the cities were starving. They had no coal, they had no heat, they had no bread, they had no food. Um, and February meant an upsurge of hope um, that this could be the end of the regime of Nicholas II, who by now had become known as Bloody Nicky. Um, and a core part of this, and I think an interesting part, is that so it's anti-war, it's anti-czar, this czar, but growingly anti-monarchy, um, anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist, especially the elites who were well aware of the question of war and profiteering, who's making money from the war, who's living well during the war, becomes a, a, a popular question. And so that um, question of um, what we today would call corruption is also on the table. Who is, who is the, who are the elites that are, are actually benefiting from the war? And I try to get my students always to ask, who's making money of a war? We, we tend to go to the moral instead of the economic. We need to teach them to, to look very hard at any investments. Um, it, it's also a whole set of ideals, of course, about letting go of the constraints of the old regime. The Pale of Settlement, which constricted Jews to one region in impossible circumstances. The constriction on women. Women finally get the vote in June of 1917. It happens before, before October. Um, the the uh, emancipation of, uh, theoretically, the emancipation of, of the different nationalities. Then the revolution spreads, right? So this is the first global movement. Um, and we pick it up in different forms. And um, we have been having a very interesting conversation. What is the Ukrainian experience of not just the Civil War, but the Revolution. What is the Georgian experience? So we know that Mensheviks take, come to power in Georgia. We, we, I'm learning that the SRs and, and uh, Socialist Revolutionaries, the Peasant Party, uh, came to power in, in Ukraine. Ukraine is uh, crisscrossed in the next uh, four years with waves of, of war back and forth and so on. But, it, but the, as it spreads out, um, the, we have to remember that the ideas were contagious. I like your... your point about it being millennial. Um, but there also then gets a, a counter reaction, which is the fear of export of revolution, the fear of these ideas being um, not just coming out to Western Europe spontaneously, but also being, uh, were, were they being, so when the workers in Togliati go on strike, Richard Pipes's response in uh, Boston and Cambridge 20 years ago was to say, see, London was exporting the revolution. And I say, no, the workers were also upset in Togliati, and they had their own reasons for being. So it, this is one of those glass empty full questions, whether you see it as uh, people deliberately exporting revolution, or you see a response to horrific conditions and a growing ideology of trade unionism, of uh, social response that, that, that says, OK, wait, we, we, can, we can figure out a, a way around this. Um, and then um, Yvonne has done some wonderful work, uh, Kurila, who spoke last panel, on the ways in which the US and the, and, and the Soviet Union begin to define each other in opposition to each other. I, have, I always think of this as a crooked mirror. We are American, and part of being American is not communist. But, but we we've, you know, tend to forget that it, this revolution had many reasons for existing um, and many reasons for, for coming about. Um, we also have to forget, we also tend to forget that the U.S. is a newly global power in when it decides to enter into World War I. We, we had been involved in the Spanish-American War, so you, you could say that's the beginning. Of course, <laughs> historians can't always find earlier <laughs> beginnings. <laughs> but but, uh, but I, uh, I would argue that in many ways, World War I is the first experience of putting boots on the ground, to use an expression, to, to explore what does it mean to be part of, of, that, of that larger world. Um, what's interesting also about the February Revolution, if we bring that back in, is the ways it was not celebrated in the Soviet Union, because it was a bourgeois revolution, because it was the toppling of the old regime. It wasn't bringing the Bolsheviks to power. The Bolsheviks weren't actually even there. So this minority had no, no part in that. Um, 
but but I think that there's um, we then need to look at the ways in which um, the revolution is about to toppling Nicholas II because he's a, a bad czar, but also he's the personification of the state, right? Historically, the what makes Ru the Russian people Russian, Orthodox faith, uh, living on the territory, the land, zimlya. This is very important, but the the having the czar is is a key part of Russianness. Uh, whatever whether one defines that as ethnic Russian or R Russian statehood. Um, the czar then becomes the object of all the blame. And so one of the things that I've been interested in watching with Vladimir Putin in the context of these protests is the fact that they've chosen to make it anti-corruption and not anti-Putin, which I, I think is, is very wise, but w it's quite a contrast to 2011-12 when it was very much anti-Putin and anti-Medvedev. And um, I think that there's a lesson here about the ways in which if you concentrate all symbolic power in one person, then when that person becomes um, unpopular, they are at risk of, of falling. Of course, Russia today has no, doesn't have a domestic war that people are talking about. I mean, we, uh, the ongoing repression in Chechnya is, is very real. Um, <laughs> ongoing uh, other re repressions. Um, but, but Syria is not in, in Russia. So I don't think that there, we're s gonna see any kind of overthrow, but I do think that there's a kind of a discourse of anti-corruption that is emerging today that we have to look at. Um, and then thinking about the U.S., there's also this question of to when do we also get all paranoid about exporting revolutions just the way it's the Russians' response is that th today is to say that 1917 was caused by uh, foreign powers seeking to balkanize, take apart uh, Russia, that 1991 was caused by foreign powers who broke up Russia. So the, the, the fear of global influences, and this is what both my colleagues have been talking about, I think is still very much with us and, and um, potentially very, very problematic. Um, and then I, I think the other thing we, wanted, we need to say is that um, within Russia, the, the, there's a, a fear of, of revolution because of the elemental quality of it. Um, people in 2011-12 in, uh, uh, went to the streets in very peaceful forms and took pride in it being peaceful. But there's, very soon after that, there was a rhetoric about arangism and a fear of an, an, an elemental revolution that would be somehow sp sparked from abroad. Um, so I think what we need to do is think about the ways in which um, anytime there's this sort of po populist uh, response to, to a political situation, it, it has to be um, brought back to think about the institutional qualities, the, the institutional structures, the political structures, and, and be in dialogue with that. So that's, I'll, I'll stop now. Great. <coughs> Will, please. Thanks so much. Um, I want to follow up where Andrea left off, and that is the question of full speed globalization which is a fascinating question because, as Andreas mentioned, uh, China has been able to continue the pace, India has been able to continue the pace, uh, but in many ways Russia has not. And so the question is, what is the legacy of the Russian Revolution and the ev evolving Soviet institutions that came afterward that have hindered Russia's inability to adapt to this post-Cold War, post War world and this new global world? Um, so really kind of the question is, what did Russia miss after 74 years of its self-imposed exile and isolation from the global community? And I want to look at three aspects. Uh, the first is really uh, the question of, of Russia's economic system and how isolated, in fact, it really was. The goal of the Soviet Union was to create a new, new economy. Uh, in reality, it was isolated, highly interdependent amongst each other, highly protectionist. They traded with their fellow socialist countries, but was not overly concerned about breaking into global markets. Uh, uh, from on a domestic front, front uh, people really didn't have hard currency, real money, so there wasn't sort of the, the consumerism that drove globalization uh, prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Now. Russia hasn't only pursued an isolated economic policy since 1991. And you can list a vast number of organizations and policy that has shown that Russia has actually tried elements of integration, most notably its decision to enter uh, into the World Trade Organization. However, in the aftermath of Ukraine, uh, we have seen a return to this kind of protectionist measures. That was really kind of one of the cardinal parts of 
the Soviet system. And it's not simply the counter sanctions that Russia imposes to protect its agricultural markets, but it's also this whole notion of import substitution, that Russia is going to create its own software, uh, its own uh, heavy machinery, uh, a whole host of other goods, because that's what it needs to be independent and that's what it needs to be sovereign. Um, so on one level, the legacy of 1917 teaches us how difficult it is for Russia to re-enter the global marketplace. Uh, it has had some success, but it has been far more difficult than other countries have been able to achieve, notably China and, and, and India. Russia not only missed globalization from an economic standpoint, I would argue that Russia also missed the expansion of international law that occurred in the intervening 74 years as well. Um, and there are various ways of approaching this. I'm going to look at a, a, a slightly narrower perspective, and that is the change in international law that has incorporated the individual into international law and has made the individual an actor in international law. And prior to uh, the end of World War II, it was the state that was the primary actor in international affairs. But in Europe, after World War II, with the, with the signing of the European Convention on Human Rights and the creation of a European Court of Human Rights, uh, the individual became subject to international law. And then when Russia decided to join the Council of Europe, it suddenly found itself in a, a unique position where the individual all of a sudden was subject to European courts. And Russia had to respond to European court decisions. And again, it's not as if Russia was anti-globalization. Um, but it was, wasn't really prepared to the challenge to its own legal system and its own way of viewing the world that outside international law could play. It also didn't like the fact that it hadn't written the rules of, of these international agreements. So what ultimately occurred in the case of the European Court is whereas Russia paid the fines, it's never really made an effort to deal with the underlying contradictions of Russian law and how it violates or doesn't uh, abide by the European Convention. And this opposition to European law has only been heightened by a recent uh, legislation that allows the Russian Constitutional Court to reject a European court decision. So what this one example shows is the reluctance or inability uh, in the post-Soviet world to place individual rights over social rights. And that is a persistent legacy of the Soviet Union and provides another example as to why global integration from a legal standpoint has been so difficult. Um, the third obstacle to globalization is something that was mentioned in the first panel, and that is the, the persistence of empire, uh, the assumption in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution uh, was, that the, was that the Soviet Union had actually made the transition from empire to nation state, but the collapse of the Soviet Union on national grounds ultimately proved that unbeknownst to the actual leaders of the Soviet Union, uh, the country had actually remained a empire as well. Uh, Sergei Ploky uh, emphasized in his talk how the, the organization of the Soviet Union actually created the Russian nation, not only in terms of language, but in terms of borders as well. And one could argue that Russia today is more of a nation state um, than, than it has ever been in the past, if only because a larger percentage of Russians make up the Russian Federation than did dur during the Soviet Union or in the Russian Empire as well. Yet to find the notion of a Russian idea or the essential elements of the Russian nation remains elusive to the present day. Um, the, in March, an expert group concluded that uh, Russia was not prepared even to write a law, somehow trying to define what would it mean to be a unified nation. And the Constitution, in fact, still does not even allow for a state ideology. So globalization, in terms of the, in terms of how Russia understands its post-World War II in order, for post, in order for globalization to really thrive, it requires the respect of post-imperial borders. And obviously, from Russia's perspective, uh, in light of its actions in Crimea and in uh, eastern Ukraine, Russia has the <coughs> unwillingness to accept those borders and with it the ability to promote uh, uh, globalization. So I think what I want to emphasize is that the Russian Revolution really did have, in, in terms of its long-term effect, a hindrance in Russia's ability to re-enter and partake in this globalization experiment. It, it hindered its ability to integrate economically, it hindered its ability to integrate <coughs> legally, and it didn't change a mindset that made it more imperial and therefore made it have a lack of respect for, for the post-Soviet borders 
and that ultimately now has shown in, in the aftermath of Ukraine just how difficult it is for Russia to shed that mentality. Um, I will close with one observation, however, and that is the goalposts as to what the legacy of the Russian Revolution actually may be, uh, as, as was raised in the first panel, is it may be changing even as we speak. Uh, and the assumption was that the world was moving in the direction of globalization uh, towards shared sovereignty, uh, global institutions, and the win-win strategy. Um, after Brexit and America first, uh, that may no longer be the case. And what we're coming to grips with, I think, today is that the legacy of the Russian Revolution may not be Russia's actual isolation and need to play catch up after the collapse of the Soviet Union and somehow try to join the rules-based order. But in fact, it might just be that the legacy of the Russian Revolution was a preservation of a worldview based on the supremacy of the notion of sovereignty and non-interference in domestic affairs that in many ways underwent a seven-year hiatus but has reemerged with unexpected vengeance in the early 21st century. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our panelists who were concise and creative and, uh, and outstanding. I'd like to add one component, if I could get each of you to comment, um, specifically with respect to the, the ideas of globalization. The more we talk about globalization in our time period, we talk about technology. And um, a couple of, this theme has come up a, a couple of times in your comments and earlier. Noting that, um, <clears throat> for example, we, we see this globalization emerging from the end of the 19th century, then we see it emerging again in the second half of the 20th century. And at the time of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, technology allowed much more rapid communications than had been the case before. But the main actors and the controllers of technology, especially really large-scale technology, uh, remained states for the most part. And, and some emerging international organizations, large financial institutions, for example. Uh, now we have what has been called a popularization, even a democratization of technology. Because pretty much everybody in this room, I'm going to guess, has one of these. Uh, maybe two or three, your cell phones, your tablets, and so on. And now there is no limit, really no limit. <laughs> Uh, un unless the power goes down um, or you run out of charging, um, to participation in this globalization of ideas and claims and so on. Um, we see again some different interpretations, I think, from different corners of the world, so to speak. And so I'm wondering if each of you would like to comment on the not in any particular order, but whoever feels ready, uh, on the impact of technology on some of the same ideas that you've been talking about and how that may change the 2017 view from the 1917 view. I'll take a crack at that one, um, but since I my interest in, in protest. I mean, on the one hand, technology obviously allows the spread of ideas or spread of spread of uh, meet meetups uh, very rapidly. This was first very much commented on in the Arab Spring. Um, people can be mobilized to come to a place through flash mobs. The protests on March 26th, uh, two, a week, 10 days ago, um, were in 99 cities. Um, the challenge, I think, and the thing I'm most concerned about in, in Russia and in the US is the degree to how do we create places for people to have um, actually meaningful discussions about political outcomes that then result in uh, political changes. So in the US, we use the electoral system. We say, uh, if your electors don't like this, we're going to remove it. I, in Russia, the, the governors are still uh, nominated from the center. Um, it's much more difficult to create those conditions where you actually can talk, not, not who needs a revolution? We need evolution of, of political ideas. And I think that, that while the technology allows people to be in there, that, you know, I'm saying something pretty obvious. We're all in our uh, bubbles, our Facebook bubbles with our friends. But how do we reach across and engage with people we don't necessarily agree with in ways that then lead to not moral discussions. If you don't agree with me, you're treasonous. Or if you don't agree with me, you're immoral. Or if you don't agree with me, you're uh, not a proper religious person. Uh, but how can we have a agreement that, that, to 
space to actually uh, concretely discuss it. Um, so I think that's, that's uh, and then one footnote is very interesting about the February Revolution is that there are several websites in Russia now which are going day by day, and I think that's raising people's awareness of what was this revolution about, because it, it, there are many aspects to the revolution, and we only could even touch on a very, very few. Okay, well, <clears throat> um, I, 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 just a, sh a short addendum to that, but that it's true that technology opens up spaces, but I think what is consistent in both the Tsarist period, the Soviet period, and even today, is that there is always perceived to be a limit as to where that dialogue can go. And if you listen to what Putin said in the immediate aftermath of the protests, he said, it's okay for you to raise questions of corruption, but don't over-politicize them. Don't make them, a, don't, don't, don't make them an obvious political target. That is the limit where you, you cannot go. So I think what we see with technology and globalization is that Russia is quite happy to assimilate technology and globalization in that sense. But there's always some sort of limit. It's always some element of, of, of compartmentalization in terms of where these developments can go. And the Russian state always ultimately decides that there is a line that cannot be crossed. And I think Putin said that yet again uh, last week. Yes, this is, for me, it's not an easy question. So I'm thinking while I'm speaking. So <laughs> thank you for asking. Now, first, this, this uh, democratization of technology, this is true and is not true. Because, of course, um, and then I will go to Russia, too. Because, um, of course, uh, th th we all use this, right? As you, uh, but many do not know how to make them. And actually, uh, this is a society that apparently is very democratic, but is not the society of knowledge. The, the knowledge is very concentrated in people that know how to do things. And there are many people that not, do not know how to do things and that use them and, and they have a very different relation to it. I don't think there is a democratic uh, use of technology. It, it's, it's more apparent than real. This is my impression. Second, uh, given that this is a general condition, I would distinguish, and I will link it to the populist and to what Elizabeth and, uh, was saying. Of course, this apparent democratization is helping spreading protest, and this is we, all, we have known this from the Arab Spring and so on and so forth, and from Russia and China, wherever. Yet, it, it seems to me that, again, it is used in different ways in two basically different situations. One is, uh, this, uh, I go back to the, this reaction to very speedy globalization that I think is a very strong phenomenon with different uh, streaks. If you are in a suffering country, that is a country that has suffered from globalization, and a country which has profited from, so let's say, Turkey and Italy, for example, or Russia. And Russia has profited up to a point, and then it stopped. For different, for many reasons, and uh, is to mention some of them. In in one, in the countries where where uh, that have been af badly affected by globalization, uh, uh, this mass technology produces is very uh, inbuilt in this populistic mo movement. This is true in Italy, but it's not only in Italy. That is, this is uh, actually part of the ideology. Uh, we are all one, and uh, we use. Uh, electronic democracy and so on and so forth. In the countries where globalization has given a lot, I think of Turkey, for example, but Russia too, uh, this m the spread of information is, uh, is not that, and I think Putin is very able in this, that, that is, uh, is very uh, uh, ca capable politician, because the demand there is not to, to protest against the deterioration of the situation. But it's a demand for getting stabilized what we already got, or to continue to get what we have been getting in the past 20 years, which is not very easy because they got a lot. And if you think of India, China, that it's not easy to continue to get as much as they did over the past 20 years. So again, I think that uh, at that point, the, the, the power and this is I go back to Russia. The, the power is very attentive to, to since also Putin popularity is built upon what he was able actually to give to the population for about 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. More or less. And, and it, 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 it's how to prevent uh, the, the fact that now this has stopped. 
to become the source of protest and so to allow certain things and not others. So I would say, to, to, to end it, uh, it, it's difficult to say, but the, the role of this apparent democratization of the of technology can be very different in different contexts, basically. And uh, you have to differentiate, basically, f in the countries where globalization, uh, for all, of course, the elite maybe were, you know, I myself maybe, were positively affected and we liked it from the fact that actually many people suffered from it and used the, this democratic instrument to build protest movement and other countries in which the attention is how to preserve what we gained and the demand for stability and also so that this, this democratization of technology does not produce the effect that one would expect. Um, it's fascinating to think of what the makers of the revolution uh, would have thought of, of an iPhone. Uh, there is, a, there is a, an old Soviet joke um, about uh, Hannibal and um, Genghis Khan and Napoleon um, on the Lenin Mausoleum watching uh, the military parade. <laughs> and, and Hannibal says, gee, if I only had those tanks instead of elephants. I would have crossed much better over the uh, Alps and finished the Roman Empire once and for all. And Genghis Khan says, gee, if I only had those missiles instead of arrows, I would have gone all the way to Vienna and beyond. And Napoleon uh, thought for a while and said, hmm, I wish I had the newspaper Pravda because then nobody would have known I was defeated at Waterloo. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, the, it, on the one hand, I think Lenin and Trotsky would have been horrified by the loss of control that that represented. Because if you read, you know, as I have, um, you know, Lenin on, on propaganda and Lenin on, on um, newspapers, and I mean, that was the key. Remember Iskra? I mean, the, 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 to create a newspaper and then create the environment in which only that newspaper could exist. Remember Lenin's favorite, uh, he, he responded to Gorky uh, uh, in early 1918. He said, we are not going to commit suicide and therefore we're not going to allow freedom of the press. Um, on the other hand, uh, especially Trotsky, uh, would have been delighted at the uh, uh, profusion of means to reach global audiences uh, so cheaply and so fast. So it, it is truly a, a, a dilemma. Um, uh, it's a dilemma, it's obviously a dilemma for Putin has been uh, pointed out by Elizabeth. Um, you know, every time something like this happens, it's, it's a color revolution, it's the revolution of Facebook, um, and of course, you know, the laws have been passed to, <laughs> to try and, and, and control it. Um, but, but I think there is, there, is a, uh, there is a balance between control and, and uh, the temptation to use it. And, and those new um, totalitarians, uh, at whom I'm hinted, <laughs> I've hinted in my in my in my uh, presentation. I think they welcome it. I mean, the 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 idea that you could uh, uh, proselytize and recruit so cheaply and so uh, on su such a wide scale, I think ultimately uh, probably would have been accepted by Lenin and Trotsky as as a sufficient benefit, even though you have to pay for it by by some loss of control. Okay, I'm happy to take questions. Um, we have microphones, um, we have cameras. So when you do ask your question, I'll, I'll do as, as Matt Rajansky did in our first panel. We'll take three at a time, and then the panelists can either choose their answer or you can target your question at a specific person. Please wait for the microphone. Please also identify yourself before you ask your question. So I see this gentleman here and the lady right behind him, and Eric. Eric Lohr. So, yes, sir. And please stand up and identify <coughs> yourself. My name is MD Kolim. I am Bangladeshi American. It is well recognized that democracy and globalization is positively correlated. But in history, we found Roman has a big empire with different national states. India, 
the uh, 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 Mughal Empire was a big empire with different national uh, USA, federal country, US, USSR was a union country. Do you think empirism or federalism is one kind of globalization or not? Could you repeat that yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. Do, yeah. do you yeah. think empire is globalization? Say it again. Federalism, federal state, or union state, or empirism. Abraham is, that is Roman emperor. There is a big Roman emperor, India, Mughal emperor. Huh. So these are also one kind of globalization or not? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's oh. empire globalization. Right. globalization. Yeah, yeah it's empire globalization. globalization. Okay, and then the lady right behind him. Hi, my name is Barbara Dello, and I'm unaffiliated. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the political story and the historical story versus the personal story at the level of citizens. And I'll ask about whether there's, and I think uh, Mr. Pomerantz alluded to this about pullback efforts against globalization and uh, maybe even in some instances liberalism in terms of nationalism, and you see, um, see some of that American in Europe. And also in religion, as uh, the Russian Orthodox Church certainly at one time was a big part of Russian history. And I think of Poland and the underground church and the, the, the strength of political strength of the evangelicals. So I wanted to ask about the influence at the citizens' level of um, nationalism and particularly religion in Russia. Okay, thank you. And Eric. <coughs> Well, the, the revolution was many things. Uh, one thing that it was was the largest default in, in world history to that date and the end of the first wave of uh, globalization, the great wave. Uh, and it's easy to underestimate how important that was uh, for Russia. It was a great beneficiary of this globalizing wave. About half of all new investment in Russia from 1890 to 1914 came from abroad. Uh, the foreign presence uh, in terms of people uh, owning factories, managing engineers, et cetera, on the ground was enormous. And World War I really was the first big crack in this, um, in some ways, uh, because the German uh, partnership was, was severed and broken and these people were expropriated and their properties nationalized. Um, but in another sense, globalization a actually uh, expanded uh, exponentially during the war as the Allies loaned huge amounts of money to each other. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow is the anniversary of the American entry into the war. The cynical read on why America got in is that they were so indebted, they had given so many loans to uh, France and Britain <laughs> that if they didn't get in and make sure they won, they wouldn't get paid back. <laughs> well, so what did uh, Lenin do? One of his most important acts was to uh, renounce and default on all foreign loans. Um, and he was the only player in 1917 willing to abandon the biggest uh, holder of uh, Russian debt, France, um, and, uh, and pull Russia out of the war. And it was part of the decision, too, in the, in the nationalization decree in 1918, mm -hmm. sort of ensured that uh, the Soviet model eventually uh, of industrialization would have to be one that was not uh, the model that had pertained for every single large industrializing power throughout the 19th century and early 20th century, and that is large-scale foreign investment and loans as the source of capital. So the capital would have to come from the peasantry through force and, and collectivization. And that model of autarkic, uh, uh, anti-globalizing industrialization became the Soviet model. It became the model that appealed in the third world as uh, a means to nationalize properties, nationalize oil industries, to, uh, to potentially develop outside of the global system. So I think we sometimes forget that the Russian Revolution was an extremely important moment in the anti-globalist history yes, that we are now living in. I think he just wants to comment on that. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, in reverse order, we have end of globalization, autarky, foreign investment. We have global versus personal stories with respect to religion, uh, liberalism, um, maybe even human rights, uh, and, uh, and empires as globalization. Yes. Any takers? I can Go ahead, sir. No, since <laughs> Since, uh, of course, I agree with Eric in the sense I said this, that, 19, that the Russian Revolution was in a way part of a movement that stopped and reversed the first wave, the first great wave of globalization. Yet, uh, 
The point you made about the loans is very interesting because I happen to have studied this in the past. By 1925-26, first of all, when they did renounce the loans, and uh, uh, they were advised not to do it by the most important advisors they had, communist, Western communist capitalists, and, and especially Swedish bankers and so on, social democratic bankers. And in, by 1925-26, the consensus was that this has been a great mistake. In fact, they tried to negotiate loans in 1927-28, and they could not do because the French would sue them and seize immediately the money. And so they had, you know, they had to, to go for squeezing the countryside, at least in theory, because they were not able to squeeze anything, apparently, or to squeeze very little. They had to go for the very arduous and terrible road they took, also because they were denied access for their own decision to the international uh, money market. Uh, in a way, though, you are right. That is, those decisions were faithful. That is, they embarked in a model, uh, a very autarkic model of industrialization. That they were not, again, what is interesting, they were not a, for it. That is, if th they were eager to get loans in 1928. And in fact, by 1931, as you know, they got a very huge German debt, a German loan. And actually, they were able to complete the, 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 the industrialization because of that German loan. Without the German money, they, they would not have been able to exit the crisis. I think, right? This is what they said, and I think it's basically right. So even then, there are problems. Yet, overall, we are right. They, they built a model, an autarkic model of import substitution in which you take resources from outside, but then you, at the beginning, but then you have your own system with a monopoly on foreign trade and everything else. And this model was extremely appealing to the new states that came out uh, of the colonization. And from this point of view, too, the, the model, the legacy of the Soviet model uh, is a legacy for uh, seasons of state building. In the sense, if you are building, uh, th if there is a wave of big state building, uh, then of course these states have, uh, uh, are, are interested in what you said, that is to have their own means and to control things and to do this their own. And so from this point of view, uh, maybe in new forms, the, 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 and with this I finish, the, the, the appeal of a system that is capable of guaranteeing to the state total control over industrialization and so on and so forth. This was very great, it's still very great, and I think it's something that explains the legacy and the power of the legacy. Well, I, I want to deal with two questions. And the first one is empire globalization. Um, the answer is yes, but I, I want to emphasize the unique aspect of the Russian empire itself in terms of how it centralized and globalized in that, in that sense. Because uh, from the time of Peter the Great and the creation of the Russian in, uh, contiguous uh, empire. Uh, what's distinctive about it is just how initially decentralized this empire is. That in fact they incorporate regions into the empire, but in fact they grant them significant autonomy once they enter. And it's not simply Poland, uh, which has its own pseudo-constitution, at least initially, uh, it's also the Baltic states, it's also Finland, it's also just simply the, the, the realization that um, in most of Imperial Russia, most of the villages after 1864 continue to be governed by customary law, that the state actually can't f f direct its resources into, in, into the empire, and that it's only really in the 1880s and 1890s when the state makes a specific decision to go after the autonomous institutions in the Baltic states and Poland, and eventually at the beginning of the 20th century in Finland, that that notion of a decentralized empire begins to change. But one of the distinctive characteristics of the Russian Empire uh, up until 1880 is just how decentralized it is. That essentially, as long as you agreed to, ab to recognize Moscow as the ruler, um, there was still a significant amount of autonomy that existed outside of, of Moscow. Um, and the second question about globalization that Eric raised, um, I think one of the distinctive aspects of, again, of Russian history is just how difficult it is for Russians to raise capital to do these investments. Um, and, and that's, again, a legacy of how the state viewed commercial law and how it viewed the corporation, how corporations always remained state entities in, even during the Tsarist period. 
uh, that you had to, well, there's some smaller corporations, but the, the notion of a, a state chartered corporation that, that receives its charter from the state continues up until 1917. Mm -hmm. And you don't go to the situation where you have kind of easy registration of companies. In fact, one of the first reforms of the provisional government is to change the way companies are able to register so that you can actually have a broader capitalist base and begin to raise the money that you can potentially might have a more uh, capitalist economy. But, um, but there is this, this consistent difficulty in terms of, of, of the state f kind of fearing the, the role of independent capital and always trying to find a way to assert control over the commanding heights of the economy. And again, that can go up to the very present day uh, if you look at uh, Ross Neft and the shareholding of, of that company as well. With uh, oh. just a, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Eric asked a fascinating question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to decide uh, what would, you know, for the makers of the revolution, though, it seems to me that th that they would not consider the cancellation of the loans anti-globalist. And the reason for that is because um, this was, I mean, as I said, there is no doubt that, that, that they were globalists through and through simply because the movement that they represented was to them a global movement and its failure or success was judged by how global it becomes. Um, but I think the, the cancellation of the loans would have been perceived by them, and I think it was, uh, simply by yet another step in, in the destruction of the uh, uh, imperialist capitalist system um, on the way to the global socialist revolution. You know, to expropriate the expropriators was, of course, the slogan. And, and why pay imperialists uh, uh, back if the money was, uh, that loaned to us was, in fact, part of the surplus value squeezed out of the workers, which is how, in Lenin's view, the, the uh, um, capitalist economies worked. Um, so that's one minor comment. Another comment um, um, following Andrea, I mean, not only the German loan, but if you, if you look at classic uh, Soviet literature, uh, you know, before, before it became censored, it, it's all over uh, uh, it, 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 the presence of the American industrial imports in the 1930s from the tractors to the Fords, uh, uh, automobiles, to the uh, industrial stock, which, you know, as I've discovered studying, you know, the glassness materials, were still used in the 1990s. Um, an enormous investment uh, by, by, primarily by the United States, in, in um, including uh, the manpower, including the American engineers, were, were a huge presence um, in, in industrializing Soviet Russia. So, so I think it was, if you, if you will, sort of a controlled, globalization um, a, or selective globalization uh, to the extent that it was compatible with, with a larger, still I think dominant goal of ideological globalization and the victory on the global scale. With Can the, I? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, with, with the permission of the panel, I wanna sort of jump in and, and tack on to, to Will's comment. Mm -hmm. um, because m my part of the Soviet Union, which is the Caucasus and Central Asia, is not has not c somehow found its way into the discussion, <laughs> and so I wanted to to talk about that in terms of empire, um, and uh, the the Caucasus and Central Asia have a very odd pattern compared to other areas that have greater autonomy. So when the Caucasus are first incorporated. Uh, they're under military rule until about 1840 when the vice royalty, the vice royalty of Transcaucasia is created. And then it's incorporated like a regular province, uh, well, a vice royalty, but, but subdivided into provinces and Uyezdi and so forth. Central Asia, which is conquered and attached from the 1860s to the 80s, goes, uh, undergoes a sort of similar pattern. It's part of it is under military rule and then part of it is, is retained as uh, separate, autonomous, self-governing areas. Mm -hmm. And so the February Revolution does not give any of them any guidance, and it's the Bolsheviks who put the harness on everybody, so to speak. But then from the Bolshevik point of view, these areas become the models for the third world, the springboard of the revolution to the Middle East and to the colonial and semi-colonial world, transforming the nature of that imperial vision 
um, into a different ideologically shaped kind of empire, which of course has mixed results, and the repercussions of which are still with us and with those successor states. So that's my intervention. Thank may, you. May oh, so I, may, before I wanted to add something <laughs> on the Central Asia, because I just had a <laughs> dissertation discussed by a student on the cotton affair. And what, what is interesting, that the ology in Uzbekistan today is the reverse. That is, mm. the Soviet Union is presented as a colonial power that imposed yeah. cotton monoculture yes. and creating a colonial <laughs> dependence, and that the Uzbek Republic was born out of denunciation mm. of this mm. colonial Mm -hmm. So you are, it's, 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 it's true, but on the other hand, the reading after 1991 mm -hmm. there became completely different. Yes. Is, we were the victims of colonial yes. exploitation in Uzbekistan. There should have been a whole separate panel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's fine. I, I just want to say I think that Eric's also a very important point because mm -hmm. the, the, the repudiation of the Debt means they have to close the borders so that the uh, it, and the sh it, of course the you know I sometimes think economics leads politics that the the inferior quality of Russian products means that they they have to close the borders and once they close the borders then their in initial impulse to close the press the they were going to close the bourgeois press right you, they're very careful w and uh, it's not clear to me that they would have closed all contact with the West if it hadn't been for the, the economic issues. Um, and and you know, because it, we, we can look at, there were, there were very uh, strong contacts around science between the, with Germans and, and Soviets. There were contacts in other areas. So th what they, in a sense, it's not unlike Putin today. They wanted the technological uh, investments. They wanted the business, they would have taken the business investments. Just don't mess with our politics, right? This, this is definitely, I think, the, the line on that. Um, uh, uh, but but we still also have to remember the the gulag, which was operated with zero technology and massive. You throw people at it; doesn't matter how many die, how many bodies are found in the snow, how many you know. You have human powered um, treadmills that are thirty feet high, and and you know. But, so that is also a, a very. But I, but again, I think it comes as much from those early economic decisions uh, to to repudiate the West, so they wouldn't have to pay those giant debts. Um, ha has these. The, long-term fallout uh, in terms of then, uh, as, as others have said, I think. Yeah. Just yeah. one last co comment. Uh, no matter how many times you default, Western invest investors always seem to come <laughs> back <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I wanted to take one second to answer the religion question. Yes. Oh. Because I think it is a very interesting international force, uh, particularly the Russian Orthodox Church. And I don't, I don't want to give a long answer, but I think it's very um, involved in this concept of the Russian world and the export of values. And where I see it uh, in, in my work is uh, their involvement in, in the, um, the connection with something called the World Council of, Chur of Families, which the... Um, one of the heads of it is Mrs. Yakunina, who is um, the railroad magnate's mm. wife. And they've been very involved in um, uh, propagating a very homophobic, traditionalist uh, notions within, within Russia. That m many of those laws were actually seeded by Western. So there's a kind of globalization of a conservative agenda that is coming from um, uh, very uh, conservative uh, Americans and not so many Europeans, I suspect, um, who are now involved in, in creating a much more conservative agenda. And it's not uh, dissimilar to the 19th century when uh, Tsar Nicholas uh, also sought to be the conservative power for Europe. It is one of the great ironies of the post-Soviet situation is, and we've, we've been talking about this a little bit among the, the scholars here, is the, the ways in which um, with his the, the Tsar Alexander I and then Tsar Alexander Nicholas I at the beginning of the 19th century had yep. an idea of the three kings, mm -hmm. the three the three monarchical powers, Austro-Hungary, uh, Prussia, and Russia would be the sol solidifying forces. And the the you know so it it, it matters. And, and then religion is, becomes a key part of that. So, but it, it's but it's very complicated, mm -hmm. and and also a deep ambivalence about Islam because on the one hand. Uh, the president, uh, Vladimir Putin, definitely understands that it's a noga confessionnaya strana, that it is multi confessional. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, I think, he has to be credited with this. He's not such an anti Semite, he's not so anti Muslim. But he's got Roman Kadyrov, who, Ramzan Kadyrov, who is uh, de facto allowing uh, multiple wives, um, yeah. the persecution of Jews, and things that won't fit under Russian law. So I don't know what he's going to do with that global power that is also shifting the balance okay. within Russia. Russia has a okay. really tough, as you said so well, Will, so a tough multinational balance. Um,
what's it? It's the largest Muslim country in, in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And Ramzan Kadyrov is the, probably the single most important political force outside of Putin himself. So. so another round of questions. We do have another 15 minutes, which is really a lot of time. So this lady in the front row, Ambassador Yalowitz, and this lady in the third row. Uh, thank you, Victoria Feinberg. So we covered the impact of technology and international business and globalization. What is the impact of language? In the Russian bloc, all countries, Poland, Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, they all were forced to speak Russian. Today, everybody speaks English partly because of the internet. So other language wars in the globalization, is Russia losing? <laughs> <laughs> Um, if, if I may say so, you know, we, we will, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> First of all, thank you for a wonderful panel. Uh, will, I just wanted to ask you, you know, you've talked about the theme of economic autarky, and I agree, you know, that that's a common thread that has to be followed, but I would just push back a little bit for now. You know, Russia is a member of the WTO. Uh, its economy is dependent on oil and gas exports, uh, and that means you know, they, they are linked, you know, to Europe, the major, you know, fuel exporter, you know, to Western Europe. Uh, they've just agreed with OPEC, you know, on sort of pricing production. Uh, isn't Russia really a little bit more now engaged in the international, you know, economic scene than, you know, than you may have indicated? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I won't have five minutes. <laughs> Right. Each answer will be one minute. Yeah. Um, hi. Oh, wonderful panel. Um, my name is Mindy Reiser. I've had the opportunity to work in Central Asia and the Caucasus. I'm a sociologist. One theme you haven't discussed, maybe the scholars did in their private sessions yesterday, is what the Soviet Union meant for the role of women. Mm -hmm. uh, some of this was myth, some of it was reality, but it did have a propaganda aim and there was some opportunity for women that had not been there before. So talk about that and its impact in the broader world and in the developing world particularly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, let's, let me yeah. address the fascinating uh, language question. Mm. Um, you know, uh, which has <laughs> pretty, pretty um, dark hues. Um, I'll get to it in a moment. Um, I I no, it's definitely there. Um, it you know, in, in, um, in my travels um, in, in f former Soviet republics, uh, there's, you know, there's more or less, but there's, there's really n never an issue of being understood if you speak Russian. Um, in, I was especially struck uh, in Moldova, where, where, in fact, you know, my, I, I went in somewhat official capacity, uh, and, and, you know, it always started with a translator who translated from halting Romanian into halting English, mm -hmm. and then, and then um, at a very high level, and then my interlocutors um, um, realized that I spoke Russian, they, they, they sighed deeply and, and, and <laughs> as, <laughs> as if throwing off a, a huge uh, burden, and they started speaking unaccented Russian. So, so that's, you know, I, I don't see how that, I mean, I, I, I think it's value neutral. I, I think it's a great culture and, I, and, and, and so on. <laughs> now, the two, um, the two problems with it, the first one is the informational dominance of, of the Russian uh, media, particularly television, and we all know what it brings. You know, when, when, when RT um, and, and uh, but forget about RT, which is largely towards um, uh, uh, the West and, and the United States, just a regular, you know, novelty programs, the regular, the regular propaganda that's, that's spewing out of the controlled or censored uh, Russian television, that's what's consumed um, in, 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 in quite a few countries of the former Soviet Union. And getting to the pretty dark hues here is, of course, uh, Russian is a lingua franca of uh, um, Central Asian um, terrorists. Um, you know that Russian is the second most popular language of ISIS. Um, um, after Arabic now, uh, that, that there are um, <laughs> Russian language schools and kindergartens and stores in Raqqa, uh, which are titled Univermag. Um, I, I saw those photos, you could find them. 
Um, and, and the reason for that is a very simple one, because, because an Uzbek or, an, uh, or a Tajik, certainly Tajiks who are not Turkic speaking, but Persian speaking, um, for various reasons, uh, uh, address each other more and more in Russian. Uh, it's become a, 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 a lingua franca of the Russian, what I call the Russian Jihad. Um, you could uh, find a couple of articles I've written about this for the War on the Rocks. Mm. Yes, I, if I may add something, it, it, I'm, I'm in agreement, but with some specification. Uh, f it's true in the former Soviet space, what you said, for sure. Not in Uzbekistan, to my knowledge. In Kazakhstan, for sure, but in Uzbekistan, people, young people do not speak Russian anymore. This is what uh, I, I've seen and I've been told by Th they people. Do, they do when they join ISIS. Oh, <laughs> <but> this, <laughs> this, is, this is something, but it's... So even... Quickly, they quickly reload. No, no, this I do not question, but just it's interesting that even within the Soviet space, but certainly the Russian language has lost Central and Eastern Europe, for oh, sure. Yes. Completely, of course, of course. and this must be said. Yeah. And but also from this point of view, just to add uh, one second, uh, this is the common destiny of European languages. Because if you think of Germany, German has been the greatest loser of the language battle of the 20th century by far, because German was much more important than Russian, and even uh, than English in scientific terms, yeah. 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And French too has been a loser completely. So from this point of view. Th the situation is uh, Russian is having actually is defending itself better than these languages, but it is losing a lot of territory as well, both within the, 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 the former Soviet Union. Of course, the crucial place is Ukraine now, in a way, the, the real crucial place. Uh, I don't know, but this is enough. Well, I, I, I agree, uh, Ken, that it, it's not black and white in terms of Russia and international trade and integration. And indeed, one of the interesting aspects when the U.S. and the EU imposed sanctions was just how integrated Russia was with the global economy. And in many ways, uh, it is Russia's, Russia's integration to that date was, one of the, was the great success of the post-Cold War uh, period, that the United States really didn't promise a Marshall Plan. Um, you can debate whether we promised or not to expand NATO. But the one thing we did say was that we would try to bring Russia into global markets. And in that sense, uh, there has been notable successes. Um, I, I do think that there has been a retreat to protectionism in the aftermath of the events in, in Ukraine. And I think you also have to emphasize the, the w what the crisis in Ukraine actually showed in terms of Russia's attitude towards international trade. That, and again, when I talk about this, it's, it's, it seems like it was an era long, long ago. But it was, in fact, only two and a half years ago. But way back in 2014, we used to talk about win-win in trade. And that was kind of the underlying principle of international trade. And um, the whole idea of the association agreement was that Ukraine would have a free trade agreement with, with Russia and a free trade agreement with, um, with uh, the European Union. And from the EU and Ukrainian perspective, everyone was a winner. Uh, but the Russians never thought that way. And the Russians continue to bring a zero-sum attitude towards international trade. And that is, in many ways, the root of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And it, it's also shown in, in, in Russia's trying to create alternative institutions, that you know, they create the Eurasian Economic Union, and yet uh, its two erstwhile allies, Kazakhstan and Belarus, don't go along with any of the sanctions against Ukraine, and then immediately become uh, uh, the, uh, means by which to enter Ukrainian products and Western products into, into Russia so that Belarus becomes the great exporter of fish to the, so to, to the Russian Federation. And bananas. And bananas. And, 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 I think, and they have other, and apples as well. I think it, Belarus has really thrived. <laughs> and, 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 Prosciutto, too, and, is, and now, is now. Yeah. Fantastic. And, 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 they and now they have a. <laughs> exactly. So no, no, they, they smuggle it. Yes. Exactly. So, 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 um, so. <laughs> yes, Russia has integrated, um, but it, yet it still hasn't kind of for it hasn't for it, ha it never embraced the policy. Um, and as I mentioned at the end of my talk, uh, it looks like the world might be coming more towards its attitude towards trade than we had originally anticipated two years ago. Oh, let me take a, a minute to, to answer this wonderful question about the role of women. I think um, you're absolutely right that there was a lot of attention to what was going on in Russia. The um, 
a full equality in the law, uh, women's being drawn into the workplace, women's in, um, uh, support for women in family roles, uh, the, a divorce was made possible, which allows women to get out of bad marriages. There were laws on um, sexual harassment that um, we nobody even talks about anymore, where if, if someone in a position of authority harassed and seduced someone who was their pachinion, the, the, you know, the girl in the, sh in the shop or whatever, he was liable on the on the books. Uh, I don't know how much this, I haven't, nobody has done the research to find out was it prosecuted. But they, so they were the model uh, in many, many ways. And countries around the world uh, went, tried to model that. But what's also very interesting is to see the way in which over the course of Soviet history, Russia moved further and further backward. And I've gotten very interested in the ways in which the particular holiday of March 8th, which Russians really love, was domesticating the very agenda. So March 8th, you bring women flowers to women in the home. Yeah. You uh, celebrate her role in the home. Yeah. She bakes the cake. She does, as one of my friends said, she does all the work to, to arrange the family, <laughs> and she feeds everybody. And then they say, oh, you're so wonderful and beautiful. <laughs> right? She's soft. She's feminine. She's, she's domesticated. And then you look at how that plays out in the political elites today. The uh, Russian oligarchs, you can go down all the lists of these billion, billion, billionaires. There are no women listed. So what is the role of women? I have a piece that I've just finished that I'm eager to, to publish somewhere on the ways in which women have three functions. They um, hide their husband's wealth. And of course, Yuri Lushkov's wife, Yelena Baturina, is the premier example. Um, half his wealth is in her name. They also, women um, are the symbols, the status symbols of men's wealth because they're beautiful and they're gorgeous and they're perfectly made up and perfectly dressed and perfectly relaxed because <laughs> they are, don't, you know, ostensibly don't anything. Women also play a role in business as the moderators, of, a friend of mine was telling me about this yesterday, actually, of, of, of and, and then, there's also Putin's Iron Ladies, um, <laughs> who uh, Mizul in the Yaravaya, oh, yeah. et cetera, who have an entire conservative yeah. agenda that they are putting through the Duma. So, so, so we're returned to a very strong gender binary. Men are in politics and business. Women are Ukrashenya. They're the beautiful or the hidden wealth, or you know, s or, or they are. I'm, I, I'm in this article. I'm going to call them the Baba Commissars. They're <laughs> the women who you know are going to put back the mo moral agenda. So here we've gone way backwards on trade on globalization in lots of ways. It's very, very interesting to see and to analyze, because who knows? <laughs> <coughs> Two footnotes. <coughs> My footnote is going to be to go back to the, the late teens and the 20s. Um, the Bolsheviks were certainly not to be mistaken for feminists in any way <laughs> at all. <coughs> and uh, and they, they recognized very quickly during the 20s that uh, the demographic imperatives of all the wartime losses, World War I, Civil War, required more, you know, greater levels of reproduction and more children. And um, they realized they couldn't do that without women, but that wasn't, <coughs> wasn't necessarily to women's advantage until, uh, until later on. And the second footnote belongs to Aaron. Uh -huh. Well, thanks very much. Uh, a, a tiny footnote <coughs> to the economic. Uh, Condition. You know, actually, this, this mm -hmm. reverse boycott or Putin's response showed how little uh, Russia mattered to, mm -hmm. to Europe. Uh, uh, the latest number was that the losses from the Russian boycott were less than 5% of the total, total uh, trade turnover of the European Union. The trade with the U.S. is less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the United States' total trade. Uh, and in terms of oil and gas, look, uh, the Soviet Union had four major imports, exports, I'm sorry, exports. Oil, gas, arms, and gold. They remain the four major exports of Russia today. So, so essentially, you could pump oil uh, and gas without being particularly integrated into niceties of uh, economic systems. You can always find somebody who will buy it. And <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. With that, I'd like to thank our panel, which has, I think, been fabulous. Um, and that is, that's the, the end of this portion. Um, so thank you all for coming. And that thanks brings our entire proceedings to a close. So thanks again to our organizers, to Isabella for all her efforts to bringing us together. Yes. yes. And an announcement for the scholars who are part of the conference. Please congregate somewhere nearby so that we can all go to lunch. If you have your very special talone for lunch, please bring them with you. <laughs>
Thank you. I had some questions I was going to ask you, but I forgot. Okay. Oh, Turkey. Thank you very much.